Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Jason Cabinets, our company, Cabinets HR, we're getting ready, ready to release our MVP, and we're looking for beta testers to test out the product. You can see us at www.cabinetshr.co. Our guest today on our podcast is James Newell. James, thanks for being here with me today. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. James Newell is a partner at Voyager Capital. James has been working with high-growth technology companies as an advisor and investor since 2005 and focuses on early stage and seed investments in the Pacific Northwest. He currently serves on the boards of Voyager Portfolio Companies, Cascada, Glider Capital, and Wellset Labs. He has previously served as a board member or observer at Casper, Double Verify, General Assembly, Sauce Labs, and Zerto. James, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Of course. So, James, uh, we're going to talk some about non-VC first, right? So, the Supreme Court just had a ruling for, uh, and you were, for those who don't know, uh, you, you played safety at the University of Washington in like 2003, 2004. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's always a big thing. Athletes can't get paid, you know, what would you feel about that? So the Supreme Court just ruled 9 0 that they should get paid or something along those lines. I don't know the details, right? So first of all, the Supreme Court was 9 nothing against you. You have to figure like you're doing something terribly wrong, right? So what, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that? Good thing, bad thing? You wish it was done back in your day? Well, I don't think we know yet. I think we're going to see the implications of some pretty rapid changes in a system that hasn't changed uh, much over the last, you know, sort of 50 or 100 years. There's embedded within the, the NCAA is this concept of amateurism, which sort of hasn't made sense in a really long time. If you just, if you look at the amount of dollars that are um, generated by, um, by these athletes, by, by, you know, primarily the, what we, what you call the revenue sports, um, typically basketball and football, Um, the concept of amateurism hasn't made a ton of sense. Um, And so you're starting to see the chipping away of, of the concept of amateurism. Um, And, and that's starting with this, what they call NI, NIL name image likeness. Um, And you, it will probably end with some radical reshaping of what the concept of amateurism is, Um, whether it be, you know, Hey, now we're, treating college athletes as professionals. That's kind of one end of the spectrum. Um, and the other would be a, my, in, in my guess would be a radical reshaping of, of moving back to a true amateurism model, um, which I haven't really seen anybody suggest, but I think one thing that I would like to see is um, I think, I think amateur athletes should be amateur. Um, and uh, you know, we should get out of this middle ground entirely. Um, where I don't think you should have professional coaches making $13 million a year coaching <laughs> unpaid athletes. I think, you know, <laughs> we don't have this, um, this issue, you know, in high school. We have amateurism in high school. It works well. They don't generate the same amount of money, but I, I think you should probably have, you know, some sort of spending caps in place within uh, college programs. And, you know, the interest is high. Um, they're generating tremendous amounts of money. So if you're not going to give that to the athletes who are probably deserving of it, then you should be giving it back to, I think, the, the university's general fund. Um, and guess what? Every, the, the, the team did well. They made the Rose Bowl. They got a big check. Awesome. Everybody gets a tuition break. Like To me, that feels like one potential outcome where you can solve the idea of, well, we can't, we can't pay everybody. Um, uh, or we, you know, we, we, uh, we, we can't pay these athletes. What would you have us do with the money? Great. Give it to the university in, in the pursuit of their educational goals. Like to me, that feels like a great outcome here. Um, and, and where I, th- one direction, I think the NCAA would head, but given the number of entrenched interests, you know, given where, you know, Mark's Mark Emmert's salary is, I think you're going to see, um, I think you're going to see people really, really dig in on perpetuating the system as it stands today, which, you know, again, people like, everybody likes college sports, the interest is high, generates tremendous amounts of money. Um, but I think that that system is getting, um, is getting chipped away at and, and we'll see some, uh, continue to see some rapid changes for the, for the good, for the worse. I don't think we know yet, given that it's only been a couple of weeks, um, but I think it'll be different in five years than it's been, yeah, you know, just over the last kind of 20, 25 years. Yeah, I know I actually did a paper on this in college a long time ago, way back in the day, right? And one thing I learned back then, I don't know if it's too true, like 
if you have a, a athletic sauce or football, basketball, whatever, you can't get paid extra, right? But if you had a scholarship, mm-hmm. like, you know, be Austria, cheerleader, someone else, you, you could have a job, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I could be wrong, but a full ride scholarship in football doesn't really mean that everything's paid for, right? Um, so they've, they started to, um, you know, there were a couple of high profile cases where you had, um, you know, people um, who, who couldn't afford, like, couldn't get like nutritious meals because the, even though they were, you know, generating tremendous amounts, um, uh, you know, of money for other people, and yet they didn't have enough money in their pocket because they didn't, weren't getting support from home um, to, uh, you know, to cover like their basic expenses. Um, and so it's, it's this, it was really a chronically unfair system. They've started to make some small changes in response, frankly, to, you know, social media pressure and, um, and a light getting shined on some of these issues, but um, uh, you know, a, a full ride scholarship doesn't cover everything that you need to do, everything that you need to be successful as a college student. It covers some of that, um, but it's you know, in my mind, it's not that's not really the fair comparison of um, you know for for these athletes who are again generating tremendous tremendous amounts of uh, interest and wealth. Um, which is even different than, you know, I, I played 20 years ago and it was, you know, at the time it was Pac-10 football, it was still a big deal, but it wasn't, you know, what it is today. If you just look at the overall numbers in terms of, you know, what these coaches are getting paid, the number of support staff that they have, the, the bureaucracy and infrastructure around um, college athletics has really, has really ballooned um, to where there's a real, um, you know, there's a, there, there's not a, a, a revenue problem. It's not a, um, uh, you know, they have a problem with where's the money going to come from and how do we pay the athletes because they spend it because they spend every single dollar that's available to them um, because they don't, I, I guess, feel like they have a use for it or they're not willing or able to give it back to the university, which is probably where it should go. Um, and so I would like to, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to see some, you know, some, some pretty major changes made. Um, I think, um, you know, I love, I love college athlete, athletics, um, but the money aspects of it are tough to ignore. Um, you know, when you see people who are responsible for generating that interest, generating that money, not being able to participate in it. Um, but we'll see what happens um, in terms of, you know, whether fans have a mindset shift. Um, you know, particularly when you're thinking about uh, college basketball and football, if people, if the mindset shifts, if they know that those athletes are getting paid and it doesn't, it feels like you're watching, you know, say minor league baseball. I know very few people who are into minor league baseball, like they are college football um, and, uh, and, and college basketball. And so um, I think it'd be really interesting to see if, if college sports emerges as a like mini professional leagues or, you know, minor leagues, if the interest level and enthusiasm goes down for it, because people start thinking about that as being like, you know, the triple a baseball, you know, team, I, you know, I'd, I'd probably go see a Tacoma Rainiers game once a year, but I'm not following it and I'm not buying season tickets and they're not, there's not going to be the same TV package associated with it. So I know that was a long-winded uh, sort of filibuster on, on the topic, but I, you know, I don't think we know what the implications of this are going to be, but I think that there's going to be some pretty rapid changes in the next five years. Yeah, I know one criticism is like people like think like only people can get paid with like the, you know, all-star athletes, the Heisman Trophy winners. But I mean, like Bo Nix from Auburn got a T deal the same day. Mm-hmm. Don't be wrong, Bo Nix is an Auburn SC school school, but really he's probably like the, one of the top quarterbacks, right? And then another example too is a, there's a set of twins that play basketball at Fresno State. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're not all Americans, you know, but they get like so 18 points a game. Yeah. They're like 3 million followers on Twitter, on TikTok. Well, and it's they're important, cash it's in. important to, uh, and I'm not sure if, if you mentioned this, female basketball players mm-hmm. um, and, and um, you know, name image likeness um, for college female athletes is going to be, you know, a, a really important uh, money-making opportunity. Um, and so um, it, it, I think it's going to break down where it's going to be pretty concentrated into, um, uh, you know, the, the stars, but I think that there's going to be people outside of, you know, the SEC quarterback mm-hmm. tier and the best, 
Um, Especially if like a strong social media following some kind of way, yeah. that's maybe a big yeah. plus up for you, I think. Yeah. Now, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not a huge social media person. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, sort of brand building in and of itself um, isn't, isn't, you know, I, I sort of find that like distasteful when I feel like somebody's really trying to like build their social media brand or clout chase on, um, on social. And you're going to see a lot of athletes who now have a social or now have a, a financial incentive to do so. Um, and so it will be interesting to see, um, you know, how far college kids are willing to take that because, um, you know, they're, these are college kids. They're going to be 18 to 22 years old. I mean, these are, these are kids and they're going to now have, you know, financial incentive to, to chase cloud and chase followers. And, um, and it'll, you know, you could have some, um, some great results of that and you could have some, um, you know, some, you know, less great implications as well. And again, you know, we just, we don't know how, we don't know where we're headed with this thing we because don't. it's been moving so, so quickly after not moving at all for a very long time. And this might be a bad example of this question, but Nick Saban did a speaking engagement at some kind of high school football, whatever. And the question came up. That, so of course, Mac Jones left last year. So he has a new quarterback mm -hmm. coming in. This new quarterback has never played a, like really played for Alabama, like a freshman, sophomore. Mm -hmm. Nick Saban, he has almost like seven figure endorsement deals already, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens if like he starts playing bad do these endorsements like call Nick Saban? Of course, Nick Saban, you know, probably like said a bad example, right? But it's like average coach, these like endorsers call the coach, hey, you know, you can't bet this player, you know, mm -hmm. paying too much, right? How's that all play into mm -hmm. it, right? I think it'd be an interesting dynamic. You know, it is. And, and um, you know, there's always been an, an undercurrent of, um, uh, you know, boosterism and, and, and the financial aspects because, you know, one of, one of the coaches, one of the, the football program's primary roles within within a an athletic department is to be a financial engine for all of the projects needed to support the entire athletic department. Um, and so, you know, raising money, talking to boosters, that's a big part of of a coach's job. And and I think you know there are tons of examples um, of coaches who don't who don't who hate that aspect of the job. Um, and and they just you know they're they're football lifers, but they don't want to, you know, glad hand the boosters and, and, and go through that, you know, whole piece. Um, and this is going to add, um, I think, another layer on top of that. You know, if you do have competing financial interests associated with, um, you know, how you manage a player or how you run things on the field, because I, I do believe the vast majority of college coaches they just want to, they just want to coach football. They yes. just want to, I mean, that's all, that's all they want to do. They want to be on the field, you know, X's and O's and, um, and, and, you know, coaching football as well as, you know, making an impact on, on some of these, uh, some of these young, young men's lives. And this is just more off the field in their, you know, in, in, in their opinion, I suspect nonsense that they have to deal with. Um, and, you know, they're really, some of the really great coaches at the college level, will probably, some of them will probably start opting out and just go, you know what, if I'm going to have to deal with all this kind of professional stuff, I'm just going to go coach in the pros. I'm sick of this. And then just take another little right. I have a, I have a relative lives in Texas. He's going to be a junior football in, in high school next year. He's a decent football player. Like he has a decent chance to get his closer, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens is like kids like that, they start up the social media following, you know, all that kind of stuff during high school. Mm -hmm. And then, and not really team players anymore, right? They're more focused on themselves, you know, mm -hmm. social media following. And so it's like the second third effects going to be like, you know, like you said, we don't have no idea. Right. We don't. And I, you know, to some extent, you know, this has been happening. Um, this is happen. The individual versus team dynamic, I think happens differently in different sports. So the, what, what you're describing has probably been more common in college, uh, excuse me, high school basketball um, where, you know, it's, it's much more about, you know, these camps, these travel teams, AAU, these, that kind of thing. Yeah. You're I, from a very early age. Um, you know, you're playing within, you know, as you said, the AAU system, um, and, and develop, you know, you're sort of developing yourself, um, because the, um, the industry is built around the individual and their, you know, potential plot, uh, potential future versus like a high school football program, because, you know, high school basketball is, is important and 
you know, we, we like it. And I'm sure that people who really follow recruiting really actively do pay attention to it. But that's not really where your name is made. Your name is made as an individual on these travel teams where people, you know, play in the camps you get invited to and the social media following that you can build. If you look at somebody like, you know, somebody like Zion, who's been, you know, the world renowned, you know, Instagram dunk champion. Yeah, for, forever. Uh, you know, forever. Like when, he, I mean, he was a baby when he was doing, you know, all this incredible stuff. Um, and so that hasn't really been the case in, um, I don't, I don't believe in, in sort of high school and college football, but, um, but you may see more of that sort of stuff emerging um, with people who need to build a following because it can be instantly valuable. And, uh, you know, if you just look at the, um, you know, the numbers of, you know, high school athletes into college athletes into pro athletes, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really wide funnel at the top and, um, and very, very few people can end up, um, you know, creating any value for themselves um, because most people's careers end in high school and then very few get to play in college. And then only the absolute freaks get to play in the NFL and make a career out of it. And having, you know, uh, many, many teammates who were able to, you know, uh, uh, have the talent and, 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 and luck and, and work ethic to make that jump very, very, very few of those made it um, uh, a, a career that was life altering um, to where they don't need to work anymore. They don't need to, um, you know, they're, they're sort of set for life financially or they can help their family in ways that they, that they would want to. I mean, most NFL careers, um, you make really good money. Uh, you make it in a very short period of time. So you pay ridiculously high taxes on it. Um, and, um, uh, and you make that money at an age where you're probably not well equipped to have your peak year earning years, you know, at 22 to 25. Um, and so you may not be spending it most appropriately. Um, and that's where, you know, a lot of these athletes end up getting in trouble. Um, you know, with this new system, potentially you could have, you know, more people who are able to, um, you know, uh, uh, uh create some value for themselves. Um, do hopefully do it over a longer period of time, hopefully get, uh, you know, those, those who will end up having, uh, you know, NFL or, uh, or NBA careers will hopefully be able to, um, you know, be able to, to create that value over a longer period of time, be more savvy when they do start getting into, into real money because they're, um, uh, you know, much more versed in, in, in making good financial decisions. And, you know, hopefully you can have some, some really good positive impacts on, uh, on a lot of these people. Yeah. Cause Alabama, 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 if it does have close to a million dollar endorsements, right? I mean, that's life changing money, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's pivotal. He might make it an NFL player, but a million dollars for most people's life changing, right? So hopefully it has the, it has the things in place to like do the yeah. right decision. Like you said. Yeah. That's, that's life changing money for, for, for all of us. I mean, you know, more, more or less, particularly, you know, particularly at this kind of age. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't know much about this p particular case or this particular kid, but, um, but yeah, he's, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be weird. It's going to be weird in the locker room. Yeah. I didn't think um, about that. Uh, you know, that, you know, why does, you know, why does, why does he get this? Why don't I get this? I was, I should have, that should have been my job anyway. Like, I don't know if he had to compete to win this, you know, to win this job, but if you're the backup well, quarterback. Yeah, that's the thing. He hasn't even won yet, right? He just, he's just on top of the chart because he was a backup last year, right? She hasn't actually won it in training camp yet. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there, there are some, you know, some second order effects that we haven't really thought through. Um, but, um, you know, but all this will become clear, I think, in the next couple of years. You'll probably, um, you know, as with any marketing, new marketing channel, which is, you know, to sort of <laughs> pivot this back to the type of thing that, um, you know, that I now think about on more of a daily basis, like, you know, this is, this is going to be a marketing channel that, is new and people don't understand what the value is that is going to be. And if you're a small or local business, um, there's probably going to be a lot of really bad deals signed and people go, Oh, guess what? Like who, you know, no, nobody actually cares what an 18 year old says about my, you know, my restaurant. Um, and so I, you know, I, I guess it was dumb to give that kid, you know, 25 grand to drop a 
social media endorsement or to do a signing event. And what happens? You sign this 18 year old kid, $25,000. And a month later, he says something, you know, inappropriate on social media or something, you know, you don't, you don't want to associate with your company. That will be, there'll be countless examples of that. Oh, yeah, I'm sure there will um, be. You know, cause these are, I mean, these are kids and they, and, and kids do dumb stuff on social media. Um, you know, maybe, maybe less so because this generation grew up with it versus, you know, I, I, remember my last year of of college um you know hearing about the hearing about facebook for the first time because it was still limited to college students and i just remember thinking oh that's so dumb and so my generation you know had to like get comfortable and understand how to use facebook what's appropriate what's not appropriate like as adults where it could really like impact your career and all that sort of stuff and um you know today's generation um, of athletes is, um, I think just going to be light years ahead in terms of, um, the way that they engage with social media, um, you know, hopefully avoiding some of these, um, you know, these types of issues that can get them in trouble or get them canceled or get them, you know, all of these different things. They'll probably be better than any other generation because they've dealt with it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, this NIL is going to provide some real um, uh, uh, incentive to be really good at it because you can, you know, you can make money if you're really good on social media um, or if you're, you know, you have a compelling presence on there and, and you can, you know, be a good brand ambassador. Um, there's now a financial incentive to do that. Um, and these, these folks will be pretty well equipped, I think, to do that. I think so too. So change the subjects. So, Startup founders, you know, have to go fundraise, you know, you know, pitch investors. But I think a lot of us don't realize that VCs have to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we forget that, right? So you're, you're pitching too, right? Can you talk about that process, how you raise money for your funds and yeah. that kind of stuff? Yeah. So, um, at, you know, unless you're, unless you're an angel investor, um, you're generally investing out of a fund, um, you know, as a VC. In fact, I think that often the line between, um, you know, a venture capitalist and an angel investor or a family office, I think that those can often be blurred because, um, you know, they can, you know, often provide the same type of uh, insight and, you know, and, and the, the product that they're providing to founders is, is cash. Right. Um, and that can be provided in, you know, from a lot of different, a lot of different people. Um, but the, I think the primary difference, like what makes you definitionally, in my opinion, a VC is that, is that you're investing through a fund. You're not investing your own money. Um, and so just as a founder needs to go out and run a process to, uh, to, to bring in capital for their business, um, VCs actually have to do the same thing. Um, and it is a, um, after Matt, your, your portals has to be a way limit more limited. Well, the, I, the primary difference, and, and this is what, you know, this is what I, I tell founders sometimes, um, you know, when, when we're discussing the difference is that like, yeah, a founder generally only needs like one person to say yes. Like if you go in and, and, um, and you can, you know, convince a firm, you know, like, like, like Voyager, like to, to have conviction around a company, an idea, a team, what you're building, your vision, that's kind of all you need. Cause we'll just say yes. And here's, here's the check you need. We'll write you the whole check. Now that, now, you know, generally you put together a syndicate and all this sort of stuff, but like Voyager will write you the whole check and we'll just, we'll just take the whole round if we have, if we have that level of conviction. Um, very, very different in, in our case when we go out to raise funds because we have many, many LPs. So we have to have a lot of people say yes. Um, as a founder, you really only need one. Um, and, and, and then you're, you know, you can kind of be off to the races. So um, the processes are, you know, are, have, have some differences um, in terms of, uh, you know, how you run them, often how long they can take. Um, but, uh, uh, but, you know, there are, there are a lot of similarities in terms of, um, you know, how you want to set yourself up, how important the concept of storytelling and trust building is within, um, uh, within that process. And, and as a, you know, as an investor, um, it does give you a lot of empathy in terms of what founders are going through um, because fundraising is existential 
to many companies. Um, if you choose to go the venture backed route, you choose to have, you know, create a company with a burn rate, it's a money losing business. Well, if you can't feed the beast, then, then the business is no longer going to exist. You're going to run out of, you're going to run out of cash. So fundraising is, a, is an existential event. Um, and it's a really good reminder for found, uh, for, um, venture, for, for venture folks. Um, it, it's, it's a good reminder of what it's like to fundraise um, and, uh, and, and what the founder is going through, you know, sort of on the other side of the table. So when you when VCs fundraise, they do like a, like a like every two years. So they or they do when they get down a certain amount of they have like a certain amount of money left in the fund, or is this different? Yeah, it's time? driven. So so different firms have different um, have a different fundraising cadence, um, and there are different fund structures that um, would have um, different uh, a different distance between kind of when they fundraise. There's funds out there that are evergreen funds. They never they never fundraise. Um, they just invest out of a single, you know, pool of capital and, and, and folks come sort of in and out of that. And, and it just sort of recycles over, um, very rare, but there are examples of that. Um, there, um, there are funds that fundraise every single year. So every year is a new vintage. Um, that's pretty rare as well. Um, sometimes corporate venture firms sort of look like that, but, um, there are others that, um, uh, that are, that are structured. Um, the majority of venture firms will um, will fundraise based on uh, how much capital is deployed and reserved um, because you never want to be out of market as an investor. The, the absolute worst thing, um, and this you know sort of keeps me up at night when we're discussing our um, uh, uh, fund planning and reserves and allocations is, the greatest team and idea walking into my office, being so excited about it and saying, oh, we're out of market. Can you wait three months until we have the new fund online? That's a disaster. Um, and so uh, you really want to avoid periods where you just can't actually write a check. Um, while at the same time, making sure that, um, you know, you don't, end up having these weird cross fund issues where one company is in two funds or, and different funds manage it in, in different ways. And there's a few different ways that you can do it and be um, really transparent and fair to your limited partners. But um, you just want to make sure that you are managing that process um, accordingly. So um, short answer is, um, is yes, you'll get it to a certain kind of percentage of the fund um, uh, deployed and allocated. And then um, you'll start the process of raising the next fund. Um, uh, so that as soon as you turn one off, you have the next one just sort of ready to go. Um, so I, I'd say, you know, the average kind of heuristic is that firms raise a new fund somewhere between two and four years and three is probably at the center of that bell curve. Um, but, uh, but different funds have different strategies in terms of, um, how often they're likely to be kind of in market. Um, and some of that is driven by, um, what you see, um, in the market. So when, when VCs raise firms from other people, do these other people like put criteria on you? Like, hey, only give my money to like certain type of companies or if you invest in a startup, I want them to do me a weekly report. How much often do you get stuff like that? Yeah, so there's a pretty standard set of um, criteria that the industry is pretty comfortable with. Um, and anything that is outside of the norms um, will be um, handled um, in what you would call a side letter, which is just an agreement with, you know, a single LP. It might not apply to everybody, um, but, but, um, you make an agreement essentially with a, with a single LP, um, saying, Hey, we will, or we will not do these things. Um, and so you'll see, um, some funds have, uh, religious institutions as, um, uh, limited partners. Um, and there are uh, examples of things that they just wouldn't want a firm to invest in. Um, and you, you can probably imagine a whole host of things that, um, uh, you know, a religious or faith-based organization just wouldn't want one of their investments doing, or they would just wouldn't want to be associated with it. Um, so that can often be um, handled in a side letter of like, hey, don't invest in these types of companies. Um, the... Um, the rest is, 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 is primarily done through a limited, apart, limited partner agreement, LP, LPA, which kind of defines and sets that out. 
And then, you know, on layering on top of that is like, is, is basically what you're telling your LPs your fund strategy is. So you go out and you don't just say, you know, hey, here's my background, give me money. Um, because, you know, as an LP, you're investing um, in a blind pool. It's, it's kind of a crazy concept that, you know, if I was asking you for money, I'd say, hey, I'd like to, I'm going to invest on your behalf. Um, and here's how we're going to split the economics. And here's how it's going to work. But I'm not going to tell you what companies I'm going to invest in. It's like, well, that's, a, that's kind of a weird concept. And I'm, over the next four years, I'm going to invest in a bunch of companies you don't know about. And I'm just going to tell you after the fact what those companies are. Like if I just hand you that fact pattern, it's kind of a weird concept. Um, and so it's really important. Um, you know, I alluded earlier to this idea of trust building and storytelling as being really important aspects of the fundraising process. It's really important that I tell you, um, hey, here's, here's, here's what we think is interesting. Here's what we think is happening in the market. Here's the types of opportunities we're going to go out there and find. Um, and then you need to have enough trust in, in me and my team, uh, you know, my partners, all of our staff, that we can actually execute on what we tell you that we're going to do. Um, because um, it's totally reasonable for you to um, hold me and, and my firm um, to, you know, uh, uh, hold us to, to what we said we were going to do. If, um, you know, if I tell you that I'm only going to do consumer investing and I'm the best consumer investor and that's why you should trust me and that's where the opportunity is in the market and I go out and I can do a bunch of, you know, biotech healthcare deals, um, I, you can make exceptions. Um, sometimes you need to get kind of permission from your LPs and sometimes you don't, but um, you can make exceptions, but you're going to have some really tough questions to answer um, when you do, you know, provide updates or, you know, uh, uh, you know, even, even um, greater the next time you go out to raise your fund. If you put up a bunch of really bad results and you're off strategy um, and I come back and I say, Hey, we're, you know, we're ready for, ready for the next fund. Um, what, what can I, what can I count on you for, you know, in this one, we'd, we'd love your support again. Well, zero. The answer is going to be zero because you put up bad results and you didn't say what you told, told me you were going to do. Um, if I was an LP, I wouldn't give that person more money. Absolutely not. Because now you've broken the trust and you know, you've, you've proven that you can't execute on what we agreed up front was a good strategy. So James recently PitchBook put out an article saying that uh, like so far in 2021, VCs that invest like $150 billion, which is already 90% of last year's record breaking deal. So unless something happens, it's going to be broken again. Why, why is VC investing so much money in startups? And part two of the question is like, there's still a lot of founders out there like, well, I can't raise money. I can't get money. It's quick. How, what do these startup founders need to do to attract the money? Because obviously the money's out there, right? To be invested in. Yes. But I always caution people um, on drawing conclusions based on these really big headline numbers um, because we've really changed the definition of what venture capital is. Um, and, and I think a, a pretty profound way, um, you know, even, you know, I started in the venture industry in, um, in 2009 and what is considered a venture capital round today, um, can be very, very different from what we would have considered back then. Um, and so there weren't hundred million dollar venture capital rounds getting done in 2009 or, you know, frankly, the, you know, seven years after that. Uh, that was a really, really rare, unique thing. Now it happens all the time. And so because I'm an early stage investor, like I, I focus on a, on a narrower part of what venture capital is. And, and I think more about the trends that are, that are there. Um, and so if you, you know, if you look at where, you know, venture capital is today, um, and you said it'll be probably over 200 billion this year, right? Yeah. In 2011, it was like 30 billion. And so, um, you know, when I think about like where things were, um, you know, in, in sort of those earlier years of my career, um, the venture industry isn't, it's not, you know, seven times larger today than it was then in terms of like early stage venture capital um, rounds. We're just doing all these other later growth stage rounds that aren't, that like, I don't really consider them venture capital rounds. If you have a bunch of like public crossover investors in a late stage company 
um, you know, that's doing hundreds of millions of revenue. I, I don't want to look at that data and draw conclusions about what I should be doing, what I should be seeing within the early stage market, because um, those dynamics and those headline numbers are driven by those later stage rounds. So, um, so that's the first thing that is that I always caution people like, yes, I, th these numbers are eye popping, but we also just have almost a different asset class that's emerged. This growth stage, later stage um, investing didn't really exist, you know, 10 years ago um, in, in kind of a major way. Um, and so the comparison isn't really apples to apples in my opinion. Um, now that said, it doesn't actually change what your point was, which is that, Hey, it feels like there's tons of capital available, which is true, even at the early, early stage. And yet it's really hard for, um, some founders to raise. Um, and this is, you know, particularly an issue, um, in, you know, sort of maybe a more regional market, um, like Seattle, um, which, um, is an awesome place to build a company. Um, it's a, uh, you know, it's a good place to raise around. Um, it's a great place to, um, you know, it's a great place to live, uh, super high quality life, all those, all of those things. Um, and yet um, it's not the Bay Area where capital is cheap and <laughs> things are flowing and there's a huge well-developed angel community like you might have in the Bay Area or, you know, even New York, um, I think does uh, a little bit better in terms of, um, angel dollar liquidity that sort of um, will flow in, in, into that ecosystem. So it is still hard to raise, um, particularly at those really early stages. As you get into the later stages, you can raise capital from wherever, you can raise capital whenever, um, if the market has um, identified you as a winner um, within a given category. Um, and it's an awesome time to, to build a company. I mean, the reason why there's so many dollars flowing here is that, um, you know, all of these markets are, you know, many, many markets are getting disrupted. There's that, you know, sort of that adage that every company now is a technology company. That's true because every, you know, really every market and every business function within the enterprise um, feels like it's getting disrupted and, um, and is getting um, touched by technology in ways that just haven't been true which I think is just the, the major difference between, you know, if you look at these blips in the venture market, you know, the first being the sort of first internet bubble. Um, and then, and then this one today where we're deploying a lot of capital into these, into this ecosystem, the end markets that the bubble companies were going after, I mean, were tiny. I mean, they're, you're talking about like, you know, 50 million worldwide users of the internet at one point. I mean, it's, it's, it's comic, it's laughable how small the end markets were versus what we see today when, um, you know, essentially the whole, the whole world is connected uh, and the markets and, uh, and, and number of endpoints um, are, you know, basically every person on the planet. One thing I'd be interested in seeing is how the stats broke down this $150 billion investor so far, like 4% were like, like, like truly first time founders, 4% were like the, Founders like fail twice. That's the third startup. And what percent it went like founders that have three successful exits already. This is the fourth mm -hmm. one, right? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that number. Um, I, yeah, I haven't seen that number. Um, and so it would be interesting to see. It'd be interesting to see how it breaks down. I mean, the, the, the number that I care about the most isn't deal volume. It's... Um, uh, it's, it's deal count. It's, it's the, it's the quantity of deals, not the amount that those companies have raised, because I think that that's a more fair representation of like how healthy the market is. And so, um, you know, deal count is up, but not to some crazy amount, which just tells you that round sizes are getting bigger. Um, con capital is getting concentrated in these later stage opportunities where, um, you know, you're building these massive, pre IPO companies, companies that would have been public in, in, you know, prior versions of our capital markets. Um, you know, there's very few small IPOs anymore. All of that value is accruing to private shareholders, which is why you've had a bunch of public money 
sovereign wealth money, you know, all of this is, has like poured into this later stage market because that's where a ton of value is occurring because there's no more small IPOs. So you can't get access to those, uh, to that value creation in the public markets. Um, and so, you know, that, again, that definition of what is venture capital or whether a separate asset class has emerged, um, I think is, uh, uh, what you're seeing in those in those headline numbers. So I, I pay more, much more attention to deal count. That's what that's what I care about when I look at, hey, do we have a healthy venture capital market right now? And you know, how many deals should I be looking at? How many deals should we be doing? What is the what is the you know frothiness in the market? That's the that's the metric that I pay the most attention to. James, is there any correlation between VC and how the Wall Street's doing? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. Mathematically, you would look at. A, a mathematician would sit here and they would run a regression and say, yes, there is correlation here. Um, but there is, um, you know, the typically venture markets will lag um, what we see in the public markets um, uh, because they are just so much more reactive um, in, it, it, you know, a, a, a daily observation of a price is just going to be so much more um reflective of sentiment than will the venture market for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, the first is um, the, the found, the, the sort of expectations, right? So um, if you're a founder and you look in the public markets and you see that, you know, great SaaS names are trading for 30 X multiples, um, that's great you know, I'm a great SaaS company and I deserve a 30X multiple. Um, you can have a shift in public market sentiment really quickly. Um, and, you know, within a couple of weeks, those can now be trading at 15X multiples. Um, this has happened before. Um, and, uh, you know, 15X is still a, actually historically a, a, a reasonably high multiple. Um, but, um, you know, founders will still have those expectations of, well, no, I'm, I'm a 30 X company. Like I, you know, this is, you know, I'm doing this, this amount in revenue and therefore my, my business should be this. And I'm not raising, I'm not raising it a dollar less than that. Like things will bounce back. And so what you end up finding is that if, if the really, really top tier, uh, you know, founders can't get the valuations they want, they just won't raise unless they have a compelling need to do so. And they need capital. Um, so you see, um, you see, you know, a lag in terms of a resetting of value, uh, valuation expectations um, that takes longer um, uh, to, to, to get there. Um, the, the other dynamic that makes venture lag is the way that fundraising happens in our industry, um, which we, we, you know, we, we talked a, a little bit about. And so the vast, vast majority of venture dollars are invested out of a fund structure. Um, and so those dollars are pre-committed and they are set to be deployed along, you know, a certain, um, uh, you know, allocation. Uh, and so if you are a venture fund, um, you have a certain amount of time where you've planned to deploy a certain amount of dollars. So if you end up with a mismatch of um, uh, where no deals are getting done because asset prices are in flux, um, you can only sit on the sidelines for so long because eventually you need to deploy those dollars. And so you, you know, you'll see, uh, you know, dollars sit on the sidelines, but only for so long. And then it takes a long time for the industry to actually contract because funds have a 10 year life cycle. Yeah. I think a lot of startup founders mess up during COVID, right? I know a lot of, a lot of startup founders personally who are like, while well, COVID, I'm not going to raise funds, right? And I try to tell them the money's still out there, right? They have to deploy the money, right? Well, I think there was a three month period. I mean, it was, you know, I just think I mean, back it was a weird and everything. It yeah. was a it was a weird time, and nobody nobody knew how deep the rabbit hole was going to go. But there. these people, I know, they just completely stopped everything, right? You know, that was and that was the prudent thing to do. Um, you know, in hindsight, for for the majority of companies it wasn't the right thing to do, which is crazy to say. And, and, you know, I, I think some of my companies where I was at least, you know, involved in decision-making, we made the wrong decision. We said, oh, you know what? We shouldn't make that incremental higher because we don't know what's going to happen here. And we don't know if we're going to be able to grow through this. 
we need to make sure we control our own destiny as it relates to cash. And we need to have, you know, X number of months to like weather this thing. We didn't, I don't think, you know, in, in hindsight, the right decision was to stomp on the gas pedal. And um, it wouldn't have been prudent. There weren't many companies I knew that know that take that took that approach. Um, but that would have been the right, that would have been the right play. So I don't begrudge any founder who pulled in on the reins a little bit um, in response to, oh my God, like, a, you know, a, this is a global pandemic. And like, can you, can you literally just lift and shift, you know, 40% of the U.S. workforce to working from home and like maintain levels of productivity and like, we've come out of this, I think, better than could be reasonably expected. Um, so I don't begrudge anybody who made that decision because I was part of making those decisions within companies. And that's, that's what the prudent thing to do, even though in hindsight, I think it's fair to say that that was not the correct action to actually take. Um, and, and from the venture side of it, you can kind of think about like, you know, from March 11th, which was when, you know, the NBA shut down and Tom Hanks, you know, America's favorite father, uh, I guess the national treasure, like, you know, he got COVID and it was like, that was, I remember the day when everything like. I, yeah, I forgot about Tom Hanks getting it. Yeah, that's, that was definitely one of the game changers. Yeah, dark moment in our country. Tom Hanks, our, he's our, our, you know, our favorite guy. Um, and that was, I think that was, I think that happened March 11th. And like that next three month period, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff getting done during that period. Um, and, um, and then I think kind of over the summer, people started getting pretty comfortable with writing checks over zoom and, you know, meeting founders and, and Hey, maybe we're going to be, maybe we're going to be okay. Maybe the tech industry is going to be uh, seeing some, some tailwinds from this and oh my gosh. And then it just, you know, it's, it's basically been, um, you know, really, really active from that point forward. So that three month period, um, I think everybody tried to hunker down um, both founders and, and, and venture folks. And, and, since then, it's been um, it's been pretty aggressive in terms of pace across the industry. Yeah, I think in long term it's gonna be a good thing for VCs because I could be wrong with this. Like, I said, like a lot of VCs that only like invest in in person. Now I said a lot more VCs are more open to like, invest you ver over Zoom versus in person, right? Uh, the comfort with um, investing in uh, remote settings um, absolutely increased. Um, you know, now that you know, some of the world has started to open up again. Like I'm actually meeting founders in person. Um, and, uh, uh, which has been, which has been great. I mean, I've really missed sort of the in-person interaction. You know, if we would have done this three months ago, we probably would have been on zoom. Yeah. Um, and so the fact that we can sit in the same room together feels great. Um, you know, I think that there's a much greater comfort, um, in terms of, um, remote check writing. Um, the issue, I think, is that um, I think it has potentially, um, and I haven't seen numbers on this, and it'll be interesting if somebody actually does a study, Re I think relationship building is more challenging um, in, uh, in a remote-only world. And so the fear was that um, you would have investors only writing checks to people they were already comfortable with, already familiar with, were already in their network, um, which, you know, which, which has some potential implications in terms of, um, you know, Hey, if you're a, you know, a 40 year old white male, most of your network is probably going to be other 40 year old white males. Um, and if you're not a 40 year old white male, how do you get into that network? If it's more challenging to do so in a zoom centric world, where, you know, it's, I think relationships can really be built. Um, uh, well, I think re relationships can be perpetuated um, and maintained over the phone, via Zoom, via email, all those sorts of things. Um, but new relationships, um, I think, are much harder to build in that setting. And so, you know, I think the fear was that you'd see investing in capital getting concentrated um, within the sort of the old boys network. Um, and I haven't seen data on that coming out of the, so this sort of pandemic period, but I think somebody will probably do a study and, and it'll be interesting to see if that ended up happening, 
um, or if we, you know, have made strides in terms of, um, you know, backing uh, people who are out of the, the sort of tip, t- typical network or um, in demographics that historically haven't um, had access to those types of networks. And from the founder side, this is the money you save, you know, before you have to go to fly to San Francisco two, three times a year, you know, money for the flight, hotel rooms, et cetera, et cetera. Now you're saving that money, right? Well, and the velocity of the number of meetings that you can take, um, you know, is, is, is higher. I mean, you can, it, you know, you don't need to, you know, if you're, if you're a founder and you feel like you've got a great meeting, um, you know, with, let's say, you know, let's say you can get a meeting with Greylock, great firm down in the Bay Area. Um, yeah, it might be worth going down there, um, you know, and staying a night and, you know, making sure that you're really prepared for that one hour pitch meeting. It might be the only meeting you have, but it's probably still worth going. Um, but it's also going to burn, you know, a, a reasonable amount of time on like a one hour meeting because you're going to have to fly down there. You're going to have to get a hotel. So it's not even just the money part of it. It's also just the, um, you know, the, the time that you have to invest. The hassle in, traveling, all that stuff. You, gotta, you know, you got to do one-on-one in the Bay area or, uh, you know, or, um, you know, fight traffic and get uh, like, that, that's a pain. That can be a painful experience. And, and you're, um, you know, I think you're, you're pretty well served by, um, you know, being able to take that one meeting, uh, you know, that one hour meeting via zoom, gauge their interest, try to determine like what information they need to make a decision about whether this is actually something. And, and there's, you know, I think that there's a lot of time saved for founders, um, because meetings can happen much more quickly and much more, um, uh, you know, with much less friction than I think the money savings, um, although for a pre, particularly for a pre-funded startup, um, that can be pretty impactful as well. So James, when people are kids, they want to like be astronauts and they grow up superheroes, football players, singers, actors, all kinds of like, I'm presuming that you do not want to be a VC growing up. No. So can you talk about your process of, you know, becoming a VC and why you chose that as your, as your career path? Yeah. So, um, I, I do feel incredibly fortunate to work in this industry. There's, there's quite literally nothing, um, that I would rather do. Um, and so I, I, I feel fortunate to, you know, have, have sort of found, um, a seat at the table. Um, I started my career, um, doing technology, uh, M&A banking, um, within, uh, a firm that was at, at the time it was Bank of America Securities, which then later became um, uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, um, and uh, you know that I think the the skill set that I developed there was really around um, you know looking at data and asking questions and drawing conclusions. Um, but what always bothered me about the industry um, is is sort of the you know the principal agent problem of um, well, hey we you know we. We did a deal. The bank got paid. Okay, great. Was it a good deal? Who cares? Like that doesn't, <laughs> who cares? Like the check cashed On to the next one. And that always bothered me tremendously um, that, that that didn't matter, that there was no skin in the game for people who felt like they were participating in the transaction. Um, and so um, investing was always really attractive to me in terms of, you know, solving that aspect of feeling like what I was doing was important. Um, because it, you know, eventually when, when you're in a transactional business like that, um, it didn't, it, it really didn't matter, um, you know, to, to some extent now, you know, there's obviously a lot of, um, tremendously prideful people in that industry and they do, and, and, and many of them do, um, do a great job. So I'm not trying to, um, denigrate that industry, um, where I learned a tremendous amount and, um, dare I say, actually enjoyed it. Um, though I think I've like blacked out the, the really painful parts about, you know, pulling all nighters and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I wanted to get into something where, um, you know, I was, uh, had skin in the game and, and, and frankly, I wanted to work with, I wanted to work with real engineers, not financial engineers. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it, it was a, a real eye opener, you know, as I started working with companies within that role, that there were all of these different functions within the business um, outside of the finance org. And 
you know, I think I went into that because I was, uh, I, I went to, you know, as you know, UW um, for undergrad and um, one of my undergrad degrees was in finance. And I just assumed that finance was a really, really important aspect of the business. Um, it felt so important to me um, before I had actually seen the inside of a business. And then I started working with, with them um, throughout my, my, uh, in my time in banking. And I said, oh, gosh, finance is really not at all important. Like it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a valuable function within a business. And, and, and certainly as you get into these, you know, sort of later stage aspects, but oh my gosh, is marketing important? Wow. Product and engineering is unbelievably important. And, and oh my gosh, someone's got to sell this. Like this is these, this was like, you know, kind of a mind blowing concept for me. So I wanted to get much more exposure to, you know, all of those other aspects of uh, what, can make a company successful. Um, and so, um, you know, venture felt like, um, you know, just a, a tremendous way to do that. Um, you can be an inch deep and a mile wide. You can, you know, work across, you know, all of these different aspects of, um, of technology in terms of, you know, what a company does. Uh, you can make a tremendous impact um, in terms of, um, you know, uh, you know, an impact on people's lives, um, both good and bad, um, which I think is something that we're now acknowledging as an industry um, that, you know, it, it, I think for a long time felt like as the tech industry, we were always the good guys. And I think we've sort of, to some extent, had a little bit of a reckoning of like, oh, we, we need our, wait, are we the baddies? Like, and that is something that I think we um, have, have sort of woken up to, at least maybe I have in the last, uh, you know, kind of five or 10 years. Um, and so, you know, as soon as I had the opportunity to invest, I, this, it just, um, you know, just was immediately apparent to me that there's nothing on earth, um, you know, that I'd rather do. And, and, uh, you know, don't, don't tell my partners, but I'd, you know, I'd probably do it. For, I'd probably do it for free because, I, you know, I really enjoy this industry so much. So James, can you talk about VC deal flow, either in general terms or just specifically like, you know, how you get like the number of context per year and, and then break, break it down to maybe two or three deals in the year. Yeah. I think the heuristic that people generally use is like, um, and it, you know, it gets bandied about so much that it, it probably isn't even true. Um, but that, you know, t you know, 10% of, of like the available opportunities actually get like a really hard look. And then out of that 10%, like, um, you know, 10% of that, is something that will actually make it into the portfolio. So if you're going to do, you know, five deals in a year, you'll, you'll really seriously look at 50. Um, and if you need to look seriously at 50, there might be, you know, 500 opportunities that you're actually looking, looking at. Um, and, you know, ultimately it depends on how you define opportunity. Um, uh, because, you know, I get, a lot of inbound, you know, stuff that just is wildly um, inappropriate for Voyager's mandate and strategy. I can't imagine you probably get emails from, I'm a, I'm a startup from Texas or, you know, outside, because you, you, I mean, y'all do a great job of putting your, your uh, demographic where you want to invest in on your website, on your bios. Yeah. And, and most people, most people do, most firms do. Um, and, and you, it's immediately obvious if someone, you know, is just like, scraped your email off of something and they're just out, out spamming, which, you know, doesn't, it just makes no sense to me. Um, why a founder would, would go through that process. Like just the yield on it has to be so low. I can't imagine that it's actually worth your time to do so. Um, but in terms of like an inbound deal channel like that, um, I respond to every thoughtful outreach that I get. Um, uh, uh, I, I can pr say probably a hundred percent of people who say, um, here's what I do. Here's why I think this would be interesting for Voyager. Um, what do you think? Um, I respond to probably a hundred percent of those um, because that shows that like, oh, this person did work and they understand like, they think I'd be interested for, for this re for these reasons. It fits our mandate. Um, uh, you know, they looked at some of the stuff that I've done in my own personal past. Um, you know, we don't, um, do a whole lot of consumer investing at Voyager, but I've done some in my prior life, um, uh, my prior firm. And, um, 
you know, I've had people who reach out and say, hey, I don't, I'm not sure this will be a fit for Voyager, but, you know, you, I saw you invested in Casper um, and we think we have some similarities there. And like, I just want to get your take on it. Um, we'll always spend time with that person, even though it's not going to be probably something that fits into Voyager's portfolio. Um, and so, you know, as it relates to like, you know, advice to founders, um, you know, in, in terms of getting on um, a VC's radar screen or getting attention and, and time, um, you know, it's totally fine to reach out cold um, and just, you know, go direct inbound with somebody. Um, if the approach is thoughtful, I would say in the majority of cases, um, and certainly I think in, in almost every case with me specifically, you'll get a response. A thoughtful outreach will get a thoughtful response. Um, but a, you know, dear sir, I'm based in Amsterdam and I'm working on blank. Like we don't, we don't invest there. We don't, you know, you haven't looked at our website. You haven't looked at my bio and what I've done and, and those sorts of things. Um, that's the kind of thing that I think in general VCs are comfortable just sort of ignoring and you're a lot less likely to get a response. As a founder, how often sort of found a follow-up? Like suppose someone emails you. Mm-hmm. So like, like no response up to second, third, fourth emails is the point where you're like, okay, this guy is out of hand. He's spammy or say so just keep on going until they can hear from you and get a no. I've never had a, I've never felt like a founder has spammed me. Um, and if um, I will ask some, I will ask somebody to unsubscribe me if, you know, if you keep updating me, like I don't do a lot of, like I wouldn't do a biotech deal. Um, there are a bunch of great biotech investors. I think it's a super interesting category, but I'm not, I'm not your person on a, on a deal like that. I don't know what's good. I don't know what success looks like. Um, and so if you keep emailing me about it, I'll actually say, you know, Hey, this is out of, this is out of mandate for, for Voyager. Um, but you know, best of luck in the fundraising or, uh, you know, or something like that, that I get a lot of stuff from out of our geography. Um, so unless, you know, realistically, um, you know, unless I have a, some sort of incredibly proprietary relationship, um, I'm not going to do a deal for a company based in San Francisco. There's 750 great firms within, you know, four miles of somebody's office in San Francisco. Um, it's, highly unlikely to be one that, um, that, that we're going to invest in if you're based in San Francisco. Um, and so, you know, if somebody continuously, um, you know, is updating me or, you know, Hey, can I get, can I get 10 minutes? Can I get 30 minutes? Like, let me look at my pitch deck, all those sorts of things. Um, you know, I'll just send a quick note and say, Hey, this is out of mandate. You know, we don't really invest in the Bay area. Um, we have so much opportunity in terms of, founders that are building in our core geographies, which are um, Seattle, Portland, um, and Western Canada. Um, actually, I should say um, Washington, Oregon, and Western Canada, because we, we're very active in um, areas like Spokane, um, Bend, Eugene, um, you know, sort, sort of those outlying areas. But, you know, Washington, Oregon, and Western Canada are core areas for us. We think that there's just so many founders that aren't getting um, enough attention from the venture asset class that, um, you know, we can't even, we can't even see everything we need to in our own geography. We can't be hunting deals down in the Bay area where there are, I mean, quite literally hundreds of investors, <laughs> you know, feet on the street, you know, with a shovel and a lunch pail, like digging for deals down there. If I, you know, if a deal finds me up here in Seattle and it's not through some incredibly proprietary relationship of like, oh, my former roommate started the company, or so, you know, something like that, then, um, you know, the adverse selection just ends up being too high. And, um, you know, there are great, great investors. And, and I think to be a great venture investor, you need to be um, contrarian, but it's pretty contrarian to, uh, you know, be hunting deals that, you know, every Bay Area investor has probably already passed on. James, what hot thing in tech excites you right now? Uh, within like areas of technology? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think one, one area that we're continuing to see is, um, you know, it's just, it, it's just the concept of, uh, you know, AI and machine learning um, getting applied to business functions. And so we're, I think we're moving beyond the, 
um, you know, hey, we're, you know, we're, we're doing this as an experiment into, no, nope, we're driving like real value within a business. Um, and the tooling has caught up and, and, and we have some companies that, that, that play in that space as well. Um, but, you know, I think the mindset around um, what impact you need to make with applying these techniques into business functions um, is probably, you know, one of the trends that we're paying the most attention to. Um, and then, of course, being based up here and investing, you know, primarily in, uh, in this Cascadia region um, is just the, just the shift to the public cloud. And it's not, a, it's not a new thesis. You know, we've been talking about this for, um, you know, over 10 years now. Um, but it still feels like we're so early in terms of, um, you know, re-architecting uh, the enterprise IT stack and the way that, uh, that that infrastructure is run and managed today. So you, you served on, on a few boards. Um, what should the role be of a VC on a board? So it's going to vary um, depending on um, the stage of the company. Um, and I think your expectation as a founder should be different from your first venture investor to the person who comes in just before IPO. Um, and I've done investing across that entire spectrum. Um, but um, I think if, if you were going to boil down, like what are the similarities across um, the entire life cycle and, and what should a VC um, actually do? Um, I think like job number one for a, um, for a venture investor is um, A, be prepared. Um, which means like read the materials that the founders send out and you'd be surprised how often that doesn't happen. You know, you venture investors, they're, you know, they're busy people and maybe they have an, other board meetings that same day, but like, it'll be clear sometimes that people just like have not read the deck. Um, so number one, be prepared. Uh, and number two, um, ask the right questions and be a sounding board for the management team. Um, I try to approach a board role with a lot of humility um, despite, you know, whatever, however, whatever the number of companies that I've worked with, or, you know, the number of times I've seen any given challenges or however much pattern recognition, you know, I'll have, you know, in the future when my hair is going to be totally gray, if it's still there at all. Um, I think the truth is you'll never, ever understand the business and the company um, as well as the founders do. Um, and so being a sounding board and being, um, you know, a partner in helping them step back um, because they are so much in the weeds um, is um, I think the, the most important thing that you can do as a venture investor. Um, ask the right questions that can get them um, on an appropriate track um, to build something of uh, to build something of value and impact, um, and the best way to do that is to is to be prepared. Actually, have read the materials. Again, it happens. It it it, it it'll, blow, it'll blow your mind how often people walk into board meetings unprepared. So, James, they tell you no, no. When you, when you uh, get a VC, you know it's like like playing dominoes. All money is in good money. Pick the right VC because mm -hmm. like eight to ten, maybe your, your longest uh, relationship. And I remember reading somewhere it's actually easier to get divorced from your wife or spouse than, you know, break ties with the VC. Mm -hmm. But when should a founder or the VC for that case to like break ties and divorce from each other? Well, so again, there, this is governed by, um, you know, this is, this is often governed by, um, you know, like legal terms. So, you know, if, if um, as an investor, we will not always, but often have the right to appoint um, a board member um, uh, as a result of, uh, of, of an investment. And um, if, you know, if, if you as the CEO and, and me as the board member decide that we're not getting along, um, you can't just say, well, you're fired. Um, and that actually works in either direction, right? Like a board member can't unilaterally um, fire a CEO. Um, at least I'm not a, Lawyer, so I'm, I'm, there may be some corner case where that can happen, but I'm not aware of any. 
Um, and as a CEO, you can't fire your board member. You can fire everybody else, but you can't fire your board member. Um, and so you are limited in terms of um, the uh, legal routes to removing a disruptive board member. Um, the, I mean, the truth is, you know, there are toxic board members. There are disruptive board members. Um, I've seen it. It's, it's gnarly. Um, and, and, you know, can really be, um, value destructive and just painful for everyone involved. Um, and you hope that those people get weeded out of the ecosystem, um, because future founders will do their work on this person. Um, and a reputation, and people with good reputations will um, will win all the best deals, um, and people with bad reputations um, won't win the best and, and and most competitive deals. So, if you're working with a good firm, um, if you're working with good people, um, and you decide that um, oh, this isn't, you know, this this relationship, this dynamic, isn't what's best for the company, um, if a if a board member has the company's best interest at heart, um, then they should be willing to um, find a, an alternative solution, which, you know, generally is going to be, you know what, we're not getting along or, you know, the company has pivoted in, in, into an area where it's outside of my expertise or, um, hey, the company pivoted and now we're competitive with one of your other investments. You can't sit on the board of both these companies. Um, in cases like that, um, best solution is to have somebody else at the firm try to do a relationship reset. And, um, you know, we've got a, we've got a bunch of great people at Voyager. If you don't like me, uh, guess what? Here's, you know, here's my partner, Diane, you're gonna love her or, um, you know, or, or, or somebody else within the firm who can do a relationship reset, maybe change the dynamic, maybe bring a different skill set, whatever it is that, um, that, um, that you need there. Um, and I think that's, um, the best way, the way that it's handled um, most appropriately, because ultimately, um, you know, not only from a fiduciary perspective, should you all have the same goals, because like legally you should all have the same goals, um, like definitionally, but, um, you know, everybody should be aligned around um, supporting the company um, and marching in the, in the same direction. James, what's your advice in this scenario? Suppose a founder out there, they're fundraising, have no success, no success. Mm -hmm. They finally find someone to invest in them. However, it's like the terms are bad. The person that they have a good feeling with the VC is kind of toxic. Would you tell this founder like, no, just no, ignore this deal and just keep on fundraising or like maybe you have to suck it up this one time. What's your advice on that? Like the founder's not desperate, desperate, like, okay, something needs to happen. And this is only like investment deal so far. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's a really, really tough case. Um, yeah. I mean, if you, if you feel like you're really stepping into a toxic relationship, I think, I mean, you have to pass, um, you know, it's hard if this is, if you know that this is going to be your only opportunity to fund this company, um, and you're wholly convinced around the opportunity. Um, you know, I, I know people who've had a different, um, you know, who've, who've, who've gotten into like, you know, sort of shotgun weddings and, um, uh, you know, we don't really know them, but the, you know, the firm reference as well, or, you know, we just didn't have a lot of options. You know, we weren't having a lot of success fundraising and I'm sick of talking to VCs because it's painful, right? Like this is, I mean, you people realize you're going to hear no, I think what only percent of companies raise VC at, at all, you know, all the no's you got to hear, you got to have the thick skin, don't you? Absolutely. Even the best companies hear no from most people. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and truthfully, um, most companies shouldn't raise venture capital. It's not appropriate for their business model. Um, you know, they, um, they should not, um, they should own a hundred percent of their business and grow it more slowly because that's what the market, the, or, you know, or the product or, you know, some aspect of what they're building dictates that like, yeah, venture capital is probably not the right mm -hmm. asset class to approach in terms of funding this business. And you know what? Funding it through revenue, bootstrapping is probably a better outcome. Um, and even though I work in this industry, even though, um, 
you know, I've come across a lot of people who've made tremendous amounts of money in the tech industry. Like most of the like super rich people I've ever come across in my life, um, you know, did it through other means. They didn't do it as venture backed founders. And, you know, I, I, I do tell people frequently, like, you know, being a, being a rich person is way better than being a venture backed CEO. Like it's, it's just be a rich person, grow, grow a business, grow it slowly own hundred percent of it and then, and then sell it or dividend yourself, you know, a couple million bucks a year and don't have to deal with a, you know, venture board. Like, you know, some of the, you know, the, the aspects that we just talked about, don't have to fundraise, um, get to make decision-making and have control, uh, you know, all yourself. Like that's awesome. And, and I think that, um, you know, the, the default, uh, when it comes to, to building businesses has been like, Oh, I'm going to raise capital. I'm going to go and I'm going to, you know, put my pitch deck together. I'm going to, you know, do this. And it's like, well, you don't need to do that. Like you're, you've got something here. People are buying it. Um, how do you want to give up control and a big piece of your business just to say you raised capital? Um, now there are good reasons to raise, and there's a certain, a very narrow sliver of companies that should raise venture capital. Um, but the vast, vast, vast majority should not. Um, and, you know, one of the companies that uh, is in um, Voyager's portfolio is a company called Lighter Capital. Um, and they do, you know, amazing things in terms of, um, you know, revenue-based lending for companies that might find that a more appropriate um, uh, means of funding their companies um, because it's non-dilutive and founders can own, continue to own all of their company. Um, and yet still have some capital to uh, continue to grow. So, you know, I, I, I do often encourage folks to look at other, um, you know, other potential means. Of, of you bring up a good point, James. Like, I think most startup founders ever like, when you raise money, that's when the challenge starts, right? Because before it's a theory, you might do this, but when you raise the money, you have to perform. You have to actually do something then, right? And all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, if somebody, if somebody comes and, they, and they, you know, they're doing, couple million in revenue and they're growing 30% a year and they're about break even, um, you know, maybe plus or minus a little bit each year. It's like, that's an amazing business mm -hmm. and they should be incredibly proud of what they've built. Um, but it's probably not something that's going to drive a meaningful outcome for a venture capital mm -hmm. firm. Um, and, and so it can be discouraging when it's like, yeah, but we grew 30% last year. That's, a, that's incredible. And you keep doing that. Um, you're going to build something that is, you know, can, can create, you know, value for you and your family or any, you know, anything that you want to do, um, you know, from a financial impact perspective, you know, beyond your wildest dreams. Um, but again, it's, it's not something that, you know, most venture firms would look at like a 30% grower is a tremendous business. And that would place you in, you know, I don't know what percentile it would be in terms of overall businesses in this country. Like what percentage grow 30% on average year over year? I mean, it's, a, it's gotta be a, you know, a tiny like single digit percentage. Um, and yet that's not appropriate for venture. Mm. So it's a very, very small sliver of companies that um, should be seeking funding from this asset class. Um, and um, it's better for founders who have those kinds of companies and those kinds of businesses um, to, um, you know, to fund it in different ways. So James, you know, you always hear if you're a founder, don't give up, keep on going, be mm -hmm. resilient over and over again. But is there a time and place when a founder should, you know, give up, you know, like, of okay. Course. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's so hard at, you know, it's so hard because it depends on, um, it depends on so many factors that, you know, that hypothetical doesn't have. I mean, um, you know, it's, it's, it's different for different people's life circumstances, right? I mean, if you're, you know, if you're 24 and you've got an engineering degree from Stanford um, and you're plugging away, you know, eating ramen, living cheap or, you know, bouncing between your parents' house and, you know, and couches, um, you know, of your friends while you're trying to build a company, it's a pretty low risk, um, you know, it's a pretty low risk opportunity. Um, your opportunity cost is, is, um, you know, it's just going to be different than, you know, if you're a single mother and you've got, 
you know, kind of two kids and, and you can't seem to make it work. You're just, your personal circumstances, I think, di- dictate how much risk and how much, um, you know, how long you can actually go, um, which, you know, I think is one of the things that works against, um, you know, certain, certain types of founders, certain pools of founders, um, is that, um, you know, people who've made a lot of money or have a lot of money um, or inherited a lot of money or people whose parents will support them, like they can actually take a lot more risk than can people who have, um, you know, less means to start with um, or, um, you know, or are at a different point in terms of their um, life um, and the responsibilities that, you know, that are, that are on there. Um, if you've got, you know, if you've got a two, a couple of kids and you're, you're a breadwinner, um, yeah, you're probably going to have to go take the job at Amazon, you know, earlier than somebody who has zero responsibilities and is okay eating top ramen for another year. So is there a point where you give up? Yeah, but it's, it's hard to, to, to sort of give, give, I think, good advice around that hypothetical without knowing the specific circumstances of the founder who has to make that decision and like, what are their responsibilities, you know, in other aspects of their life? So James, you talked about deal terms earlier. Can deal terms be pro VC and pro founder or it has to be either or? Um, I think, I mean, I, to state the obvious, we're in a, um, you know, they, they say that the pendulum swings on this topic, um, over time. And right now, oh, we're in this founder friendly environment and, and, you know, and founders are king and founders can get whatever they want. I'd say largely that's true. Um, but, you know, I would say that the perception changes over time so that, um, you know, I, when, when we sign a deal, typically it's it feels pretty standard. We don't, you know, I, at least personally, like, I don't think we spend a whole lot of time negotiating on deal points in the vast, vast majority of our, um, uh, of our deals. I think that, um, you know, there's emerged a, a set of, um, terms that everybody's pretty comfortable with. And like, realistically, the, the best way to manage, um, you know, a, a deal and entering into, you know, a, you know, as you said, sort of a, you know, a marriage or a, a you know, this sort of uh, investment relationship is to have everybody super well aligned and, and everybody transparent and everybody understanding um, what's going to happen in any of these different range of outcomes. And so, you know, you know, hiding stuff um, within a term sheet or really pushing on something that's going to potentially divide interests in certain, um, in certain potential outcomes. Like, I just don't think it makes sense. Um, I like to have as few levers as possible when I go into a negotiation. Um, so I think the best framework is, Hey, let's do standard terms, nothing weird. And then let's negotiate like what we think the right valuation is. So that's going to be like literally the one lever that, um, that you and I would discuss to try to figure out, um, if we're in the right bargaining zone and we, we feel like we can get something that you're comfortable with and I'm comfortable with. Um, and then there's no weird circumstances where, oh, well, they had these weird terms. And so their interests are massively divergent from the common shareholders or the early preferred shareholders, or, you know, these late stage people, because, the more and more structure you put onto um, a transaction, the more likely it is that weird stuff's going to happen where, oh, this later stage investor is pushing for this outcome because they don't care, you know, what happens to common shareholders or this or that. And, and you just want to avoid as much of that as you can. James, from your point of view, how important or not important it is for early stage startup to have a board of advisors? I, I don't personally put a lot of weight on board of board of advisors because I think that the majority of those folks don't do anything. Um, and I think that there's a cottage 
industry of startup advisors who are just trying to reach their hand into founders po- pockets and just try to get, just try to get a little taste, just try to, you know, just try to get onto the cap table some way. They're trying to build a portfolio. They're trying to not put their own capital at risk um, and yet still have some sort of upside. Um, and, um, you know, some of these people are great. Some of them are great actors, but there's, um, you know, it's something that I always caution founders to be careful with. Um, and make sure that you're vesting these people over time. Yeah. Especially say, I want 10% of your company to be your advisor. That's a well, the answer red is flag. No. Yeah. If, 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 if the ask is 10%, then the, the answer immediately is no, because you'll never, that becomes a cap table issue mm-hmm. um, in terms of downstream investors looking at this and going, who, who is this person? Yeah, exactly. They, is this a full-time employee? Is this a, is this your CTO? Like, why is this person in the cap table? So make sure that you vest them over time. Um, if you can tie it to milestones, it's even better. Um, you should be able to terminate it if the person is not performing. Um, and, and I've had to go through some of this, um, in, in cases where it's like, you know, I'll, I'll come in to a company and I'm ready to invest. I'm like, who is this person? Oh, that's an advisor. Well, what, what are they, what are they doing? What are they advising on? Oh, you know, they said they were going to make some intros and you know, they made one and it, but it didn't really work out. And so, um, you know, but I, I, I do talk to them, you know, every once in a while and they're, well, are they adding value? Like what this is, you could hire, you know, two engineers for this amount, um, in terms of equity. And, um, and so I'm pretty, I, I caution people to be pretty careful around, um, advisors set very, very clear expectations, um, and hold them to it, make them, make sure that they're performing um, against what they say that they're going to do, because I think um, in many cases that doesn't end up working out, um, and people represent, you know, relationships or a, a, an ability to make an impact or open doors or you know whatever it is um, that um, that doesn't end up coming true. James, can you give us an example of an email template that if you got a co email was template you'll catch your eye, like you know. Hey, James, I'm Jason. I have an HR tech company. I've, you know, I've, my metrics are this, my board advisors is this, or the case may be. No, I won't because I don't want a template. I want something that feels the opposite of a template because I, what I really want is somebody who's, who is thoughtful about why they're, re, why somebody is asking for time, why they want. Um, so more personable, more authentic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, if it feels like a template, it's way more likely to get ignored by, by VCs. Than something that's like, um, you know, hey, James, um, I saw that you and I, you know, you and I shared a bunch of connections in common, including so and so, who's a you know, really good friend of mine. Um, and, you know, look, I know, I know Voyager does, uh, you know, B2B investing up in Seattle. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm based in Spokane. And so I thought this might really be interesting. And here's what I'm working on. Um, you know, I, I know that you're an investor in Well Said Labs, and I think it has, you know, uh, we have some adjacencies or I think our business model is similar. And I'd love to get your insights in terms of, you know, X, Y, and Z. Can I, sh- can we get 30 minutes in- to share the story? Of course. Got it. You know, I'd love to. And it, how can I help? Even if it's not a fit for me, let me introduce some other folks because you've already proven that you're a thoughtful person. You're resourceful. You're willing to put the work in. Um, and that an email like that will get a response 100% of the time. But if it feels like a template and, and, you know, we see some, I'll see some of the stuff where it's like, my name is in a different font than the body of the email where you're explaining, you know, how great. So, so obvious copy it. and paste and, you know, they can take the time to like make it match. Yeah, don't whatever. do that. Like I, if it feels like a template, it's, it's way more likely to get ignored. If it feels like it's very personal, um, you will get a response a hundred percent of the time. And I think that's from, you know, many, many, many VCs. You'll get a response. hundred percent. So James. Talk about the Seattle tech startup scene. Like what makes it different? Different can be mean different in general. Is it better or worse? I mean, what's the dynamics here? Well, better, better, worse than what, I guess is the question. Um, it's smaller and different than say the Bay Area. When that's, that's, I, I'm assuming that's the comparison you're actually talking about because that's. I mean, Bay, Austin, New York City, any general place, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think they all have their own, they all have their own idiosyncrasies. And I, and, and I think the, the primary con- uh, comparison is, is typically the Bay. Um, and that's where I spent most of my career. So I'm, I often, I think on every, 
panel, um, that's often the, the I, I get that asked that question like 90% of the time because I, I was an investigator for, um, for a long time. Um, and we're just so different. Um, we do different things really well. Um, we have less density um, and, um, you know, sort of critical mass in certain areas. Um, and one of those is, is the venture ecosystem, obviously. Um, you know, we're, in terms of the venture, in terms of the tech ecosystem, we're, you know, we're about a tenth the size of the Bay Area, uh, just in terms of like the number of people working in that industry. But we have one one hundredth of the capital investing up here. So there's just, it's just, it's just a different market that, um, and has different market dynamics than, than I think exist probably anywhere else. Um, so I, I would say that from the venture ecosystem, the biggest difference is that there's just much less capital available here um, than there is in the Bay Area. Um, and, uh, and, you know, to me, that was part of my thesis in moving up here from the Bay Area. Um, even though I grew up in the area, um, I didn't really think I was ever coming back to Seattle, um, but felt like there was a tremendous opportunity um, to invest up here in this ecosystem um, and thought Voyager was really well positioned, um, uh, you know, to be part of um, a tremendous growing ecosystem up here. Um, from, a, from a tech company building perspective, um, we have unbelievable amounts of engineering talent, um, engineering product talent. It's, um, it, it's a higher density, uh, you know, probably than, than anywhere else, um, just in terms of, hey, I need a person who can build a thing. Um, you can probably find that um, here um, easier than, than anywhere else, maybe the Bay Area. It, it, it would depend on, I think, probably how you cut the data. Um, but really, really remarkable depth of engineering talent. Um, the area where, um, you know, realistically we punch below our weight a little bit is in on the go-to-market side. So um, we don't have a tremendous amount of, you know, B2B marketing talent, uh, B2B head of sales. That's kind of, still kind of a rare profile here. Um, because though you can train great product and engineering folks um, at Microsoft and Amazon, which are sort of the, you know, place you have to start every conversation about Seattle's tech ecosystem at those because they're so, you know, they're such heavyweights in terms of just the scale within those organizations up here. Um, but you can train great engineers there, but the go-to-market that those companies have is really so different than the way that startups go to market that um, it's, it's much harder to pull somebody out of um, Microsoft where they've been running channel deals for, you know, their entire career and say, oh, great. Hey, now go do some, you know, one-to-one -one selling and, and just, you know, brute force your first four enterprise deals. Like, well, they, I'm sure they can do it. There's incredibly talented people at Microsoft but it is different. And so um, it's not obvious, I think, um, in terms of people making that transition. Um, and so we really need to augment the kind of go to market side in a lot of our companies for folks who are building up here. And sometimes that can mean recruiting talent from the Bay Area and bringing them up. It can be, you know, having your first go to market person based in the Bay Area. Um, because there's a lot of customers down there. And there's a lot of talent down there. Um, and so I think that that's changing to some extent over time. But historically speaking, that's been the biggest difference is that, um, you know, we have um, incredible depth of talent in some areas um, and uh, a much shallower talent pool within kind of the go-to-market side. So James, this is a founder, who this founders in Seattle. So they focus all the fundraising in Seattle, so you, like maybe 10% in San Francisco, Tremors in Austin. How would you recommend them doing that? Uh, well, short answer is absolutely not. Um, even, you know, and, and I would never be so self-serving, um, you know, to say, no, only raise, no, only raise in Seattle. No, absolutely not. Every, um, every company that gets to scale um, 
within Seattle's ecosystem is going to raise money from outside of Seattle at some point. Um, and so you need to have relationships. You need to have an ability to fundraise outside of Seattle if you're going to be successful. Um, now, my strong belief is that, you know, your first venture round, um, those, that really important stage where you start company building, my very strong belief is that um, you should raise that round um, from somebody who's feet on the street in the place where you're going to have um, your headquarters, where you're going to have your, your, your critical mass. Um, there's a ton of great Bay Area firms. Um, and, 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 and truthfully, almost every deal that we do has some component of Bay Area capital. Um, and so, you know, I, I sort of mentioned the, the concept of syndication um, in deals earlier. Um, the vast majority of uh, investments that we do, we lead, but there's almost always some out of town capital um, uh, in also invested in the company. Um, I think the best, the best companies are the, the companies that are going to be, you know, set up for success longer term will, um, will raise their first round here in town because I think at that really formative stage in a company's life cycle, um, you're just going to get a higher level of service from people who can have coffee with you every week. If you want it, um, then somebody who's going to, you know, investing out of a really large fund out of the Bay and like, realistically they're buying a call option. If this really works like, Oh, great. We're already an investor, but we wrote them a $2 million check out of a $600 million fund. Like we don't care about that investment. We care about the potential of that investment, but it's not a meaningful number for us right now. So I think that local venture can offer a fundamentally different product to founders, but um, over time, you're going to raise money from the Bay Area at some point. Um, and you should always be um, having a dialogue down there. And it's incumbent on me and Voyager and other investors in this ecosystem to show founders why they should raise their first round of capital here in town. James, so a founder's ready to raise capital, right? Should they like make some kind of big public announcement that everyone know? Or should it be more like on the download, so to speak, where they just, just talk to investors or should it be some kind of big public spectacle, so to speak, you know? Like um, I'm raising funds, you know? Yeah, it depends on where the business is. I, I think that as it relates to PR, everything should support your business strategy. So um, one thing that I find extraordinarily irritating is when companies do PR um, for the wrong reasons. Um, like, for example, I've seen companies do PR because their investors ask them to, which I, I detest. I, it drives me absolutely bonkers because if the company, you know, the company might not be telling the story that's most, most advantageous to them, or they might be driving a bunch of interest and their product's not ready. Um, and so, my overall approach, you know, I think companies, sh investors and companies um, should be aligned around do what's best for the company. Um, and so um, a funding round can drive interest in the company. It can be really helpful uh, in a lot of different areas, um, uh, particularly around um, awareness and recruiting. So it's much easier to recruit someone um, to a company that's funded because, oh, guess what? Now I know they can pay me. Like that's really important. And um, if you're doing something really interesting and innovative and unique, you'll start getting inbound resumes. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to hire engineers right now. And so if you, you know, get identified as the hot thing because you raised a hot round and you get some, you know, some great PR pieces, like, great, that's all, that's all positive. But um, I wouldn't recommend a company do some huge big funding announcement mm. unless it supports their business goals, their product is ready. They want to shine a light on some aspect of what they're doing or they're trying to drive their recruiting funnel. Um, whatever the goal is needs to be the driver of, um, of your PR and press strategy. So James, me and you both know a guy named Andrew Klein. He's a mm -hmm. head of the accounting. He has a, a monthly meetup called Cigar and Startups. He's telling me a story where it wasn't you, but he had a, a, one of your uh, partners from Voyager was speaking, he basically said, we don't invest in start, we don't not, we do not invest in startups or ass, start founders or assholes. Mm -hmm. What's your process to make sure you don't invest in <laughs> assholes? Well, we, I mean, we reference everybody that, um, 
that we um, that we invest in. Um, and often we know these people for a long time. Um, you know, there's there's examples. Uh, you know, there's a great company here in Seattle um, called Zipwhip um, that uh, that just quite literally just sold to uh, uh, to Twilio. Great outcome. The founder is a wonderful, wonderful guy. What, the, excuse me, the co-founder um, is a wonderful, wonderful guy named uh, John Lauer. And he's somebody that I think we had known for seven years before we invested um, in the company. Uh, they were working in a slightly different idea. It was more of a consumer play. And then they sort of pivoted around and they found something that, um, that they were able to build a tremendously valuable business on. Um, but that was somebody that we had known for a really long time. And often that's the case um, that, you know, you, you, See so a founder, they share a very raw idea. You develop a relationship over some number of months um, uh, or even sometimes years um, to where they're ready for, uh, ready for investment. They're ready to scale this thing up. Um, and, uh, and that's the point where, you know, you sort of jump, jump in and, uh, and, and make an investment. Um, as part of the diligence process, you're talking to people that they've worked with in the past. Um, and, uh, and you're spending as much time with them as you can during the investment process. Now, you sort of mentioned that quote, which I think is a bit of a Voyager truism and something that we say often, um, but I think it was a slightly, slightly misquoted or it didn't have the other part of the quote, which is um, that actually like you kind of need the right amount of jerk in the CEO chair. So there's, there's not, you, you can't have um, a, Mr. A, nice guy all the time. It, it can't be somebody who's too nice. And, and there are, there are founders um, who might be too nice to be successful, um, which, which sort of places you on a spectrum of somebody who might be, you know, totally capable, but is somebody that, uh, you know, is going to have trouble hiring or more likely retaining um, and that's going to be, you know, impactful for, for the business. And frankly, something you just don't want to share success with. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum is somebody that, you know, we all know people who are too nice to be successful. Um, and, uh, you know, we all, you know, we all have, we all know people who, you know, get run over by their significant other. And you're like, God, you're, you know, you're too nice or you can't, you know, like they're not successful in their personal life because they're too nice or too accommodating. Um, and, and being a CEO is a really, really tough job. You have to make really tough decisions. Um, you know, think about where we were in the early COVID days and, you know, many, many companies were making layoffs. Um, you know, if, if the company is in dire straits, what if you're not willing to make the hard choices because you're too nice, because you don't want to disappoint people? Um, that can be really detrimental to the company as well. So there's a, um, you know, there's a, there's a correct jerk factor. Um, and it's not zero, but it's also not a hundred. <laughs> and so you need to make sure that the person is appropriately calibrated to be willing to do the really hard things that a jerk is good at. Um, while also being somebody that can retain, uh, talent, recruit, um, and somebody that you want to share success with. So James, so far in your experience, can you talk about some characteristics that successful founders have and also characteristics that unsuccessful founders have? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think about the, like the most common characteristic I see in highly successful people. Um, and, and, and founders in particular, I actually think it's, it's the ability to like, multitask and do many, many things well. Um, and it's interesting, you know, because especially like if, if you, um, you know, if you're in an early stage company, um, you know, I love that adage of like, there's only two jobs in an early, early stage company. You're either building something or selling something like that's it. Those are the only two roles, but in actuality, um, you know, if you're a, if you're a founder, you're also head of HR, you're also head of legal you're almost certainly running sales from, you know, from the jump. Get a customer service. Um, you're probably customer service. You're probably setting the product direction. Um, uh, and, you know, and you're splitting up all of those jobs among the, 
you know, one, two, or three co-founders, which is, you know, probably. And don't forget, you're also probably the data entry clerk. All of those things, you know, your chief janitorial <laughs> officer. I mean, all of those things fall in, fall in it. And, and I would say the characteristic that I've seen of, of successful founders is the ability to juggle all of those pieces um, and parallel process all of those different things. Um, because, you know, just think about the fundraising process that can be all encompassing. That's like a, go out like a time suck, right? You got to go all in on fundraising. Don't Absolutely. You? And guess what? You also have a business to run. You're also, you know, running sales and you're, you know, you need to keep the engine running on the actual company while at the same time, um, you know, managing a fundraising process where you have all of these different parties that are asking you different questions, different documents, different, um, you know, you've got to keep everything straight in your head in terms of what you told all these different people, when you're going to get back to them. I, it's, it's a lot. And so I think really successful founders just have a tremendous capacity to, um, to process. And some probably do that through um, organization and they're just very structured and, and, and are able to just sort of brute force things through, um, you know, their, their ability to speed, like process things really speedily. Um, some probably are just great parallel processors. Um, but if you are a linear thinker and you process things in a serial fashion, I'm going to do this, then I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna do this. You're probably not going to be successful as a founder. Um, if I had to guess, um, in terms of characteristics of unsuccessful founders, I'd say, um, people that can't hire, um, tend to be unsuccessful people who can't storytell, um, and um, persuade people to join a crazy endeavor. Um, I mean, it's, uh, you know, again, this is just kind of one of those weird concepts when you step back at it. You know, if I say, hey, when you join my company, we're gonna lose money, a lot of money. So, um, you know, do you have interest in, in taking equity in a money losing business that may at some point not lose money? Um, that's not a very attractive proposition like in a vacuum. And so you need to be very convincing through your personal relationships, through your storytelling, to be able to get people to join that. And if you can't hire, uh, you know, attract and retain talent, then you're probably not going to be successful as a founder. James, so for Voyager Capital, um, you talked about this a little bit earlier. Can you perhaps go to more detail, detail like how it got started, or you focus on what the Voyager Capital we're focused on right now, like yeah. investment, and then like, What's the long-term vision? Like, do you want to be like the number one VC in, in the Pacific Northwest? Number one in a certain demographic? Like, what's the vision yeah. for Voyager Capital? Yeah. So Voyager was started uh, in the late 90s, um, has always been based here in Seattle. It was kind of the, uh, you know, I think the formalization of um, uh, investing efforts in, um, you know, in, in, in three people um, who were, you know, I, we might call, now call them super angels, but, um, you know, they'd been investing um, they were former executives at um, technology companies here um, in town and um, formalized that with a fund uh, in, in, in kind of the late 90s. Um, has always been focused on B2B, um, but in our more recent vintages have been focused, as I said, exclusively on this, what we call the Cascadia region. So for, the, for anybody who's not uh, based up here in Seattle, they'll say, well, what is, what is Cascadia? What the heck is that? Um, so the Cascade Mountain Range is uh, Mountain Range runs up um, uh, basically up the coast, um, Washington, Oregon, Western Canada, um, and that's the region where we see the most opportunity today, and where we um, focus uh, the vast vast majority of our time. Um, we focus on what we call first venture round investing, um, and the um, the reason we use that phrasing is that. Um, the definitions of seed and pre-seed and seed extension, seed plus, seed, you know, post-seed, seed two, seed star, whatever. All it is. these confusing terms. And series A, all of those definitions have gotten really wonky. Um, and all of those definitions are even a little bit different um, in the Bay Area versus in Seattle. So um, we use the term first venture round investing. Um, I would say, most of what we're doing today would be um, termed like an institutional seed, but we do some series A. 
Um, and we do a little bit of pre-seed as well. So, um, you know, it's really across that spectrum, but typically we're formalizing a board, we're leading a round. Um, most of the rounds that we do are between kind of two and 10 in terms of the, the overall size. We're usually doing at least half of that amount, um, leading it, taking a board seat, and really just digging in and helping founders. Um, in terms of the overall vision for what I think, um, you know, Voyager is and can become, um, I don't really spend a whole lot of time thinking about like, you know, oh, we're going to be the number one venture firm or we're going to take over this and blah, blah, blah. Like, I just want to, I just want us to like be the firm, um, within our region that people want to work with the most that drives the greatest impact for founders within the Cascadia region. James, is there anything that I sort of asked you that I didn't ask you or anything else you want to talk about that we didn't cover already? No, I mean, I think, um, you know, as I said, sorry for filibustering on the, uh, on the NCAA topic um, and, and burning up a, a, a time for, um, which may not be interesting to, <laughs> to some of your listeners. Um, but no, I thought this was a, I thought this was a great chat. I, um, you know, I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to uh, chat, to chat. So James, can you share your social media for both yourself and your, and your, and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah. So, uh, I'm around on LinkedIn. Um, I do, uh, uh, I'm not particularly active, um, on Twitter, but my Twitter handle is, uh, James F Newell and E W E L L. Um, and, uh, and my, you know, my, web, my email is on the website. It's just Newell, uh, at voyagercapital.com. And to the listeners, we have our social media links on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.kevinshlblog.com. And don't forget to sign up for the wait list for our beta testing at www.kevinshlblog.co. So James, we're kind of end with this great conversation. Can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Yeah, well, I would say, um, well, don't, yeah. In terms of, in terms of advice, don't take any advice from, whatever VCs are posting on Twitter, um, or, uh, uh, or saying, um, on a, uh, uh, on a podcast or, 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 or live stream. Um, you know, I think just because somebody's a good investor doesn't mean that they're, they, they should be a guru and give life advice, uh, as well. So, um, you know, develop real authentic relationships with people outside of social media. Um, you know, most of what's available on there is just marketing anyway. So, um, you know, get, get, uh, once the world kind of opens up and everybody's getting, getting together in person, you know, get back out there, meet lots of people, develop lots of authentic relationships. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, hopefully meeting, uh, meeting lots and lots of people in the next year. James, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.